Hi, everybody. Welcome back once again. This is Mark Lawrence, and we're all set to go against the spread on this week's NFL and college football cards as the college football card passes the midway portion of the season, if you can believe it. NFL week number seven at hand on tap this particular weekend. And with that, I want to welcome in our panel of experts to the show, as we always do, starting off with Andy Isco from TheLogicalApproach.com in Las Vegas. Andy, how are you these days? I'm fine, Mark. Uh, just as soon as we thought we have reached a calm period with baseball down to the World Series and halfway through the college football and almost the same point in the pro seasons, we get hit up with the hockey season that's been underway for nearly a month, the NBA, which started the other day, and uh, the night before Election Day, we've got a schedule of college basketball tipping off the season. It's not like the days when we were first starting out where there was a, a lag period of sometimes two to three weeks between uh, the end of uh, one season and the beginning of another. So, uh, And not only that, we probably had about half the number of teams to worry about in each of those sports, the way we, expansion is, uh, has, uh, has grown over the years. But I personally like it. The more options, the better, and the more uh, the more days that we have to spend handicapping different sports, I think the sharper we become. Well, the more enjoyment we have, that's for sure, especially being the sports fans that we are, looking at it from our point of view. Victor King from the Playbook Totals tip sheet on a nice winning run again this football season. How was your past week? I know you had a nice trip up to Cleveland, Ohio, uh, visiting your family. All in all, how was your trip? Thank you, Mark. Very, very nice. Uh, nothing beats Northeastern Ohio in the fall. The leaves changing their brilliant colors, the weather a little bit cooler, and for us, something to actually celebrate. 2023 was a rough one. We lost multiple family members, as you know of, but it was really, really nice to celebrate something nice. In this case, the uh, wedding of uh, my brother's son, uh, my nephew, on Saturday night. And not only that, Mark, but um, I looked like a pretty good handicapper on Saturday night, too, during the wedding when I told all the wedding guests to play Georgia on the money line <laughs> against go. Texas, thanks to my mentor <laughs> coming down strong with Georgia as his five-star game of the month. What, what time Mark, did thanks you for the help. Them? Thanks for the uh, advice, and I look pretty good, but I did tell him afterwards it was the main man who said Georgia was going to beat Texas outright. Victor, I want to know what time did you tell your guests? Was it before or after the uh, celebration started? Uh, it was before even, before all the okay, liquor was good. flowing, yes. A exactly what I was concerned about. <laughs> right. At halftime, were you considering to tell them to buy half of that bet back, Victor? <laughs> no, no, no. Not, not at all. We rode it till the end. And uh, the, the family members there were a lot of Georgia people anyway. So they were absolutely thrilled that uh. you were on Georgia and that we told them to grab the points. If you feel really nutsy, go ahead and play them on the money line. Awesome. Good time. Good trip to Cleveland, Ohio. Jim Feist, I know you go to Cleveland quite a bit. Your wife hails from the same city that I do. How ironic is that? I come from a yes, small sir. suburb in Cleveland, and Jim's wife is from that very same suburb. So yep, I, I enjoy it there. Of course, when I go there, I end up at the Cleveland Clinic. That's my vacation spot. <laughs> well, you have but to go in the fall, though, Jim, like Victor says. Have you been there in the fall in Cleveland? Actually, I have, oh, yeah. and I'll probably be there before, this, before Christmas. So I'm, at least I'm not planning on it. So... But but it might actually be snowing by then. So. Yeah, it might be. The snow might be covering right. the brilliant right. colors yeah. on the colors of the yeah. leaves. Should say. But it is right. a brilliant a brilliant scene, no doubt about it, uh, when the trees change their colors. Tony Mejia, playbook experts, contributor to the Sporting News. All in all, how was your week last week? Well, it was a bloodbath in college football, and the good times continued in the NFL. So we will look to bounce back because uh, college ba uh, football had been great. So, you know, just having a, one of those weeks, I, I basically say it happens once, you know, hopefully not twice, but, you know, usually twice a season it, it, with a three, three and a half month span. But it was uh, it was pretty rough. I was not on Georgia. Uh, that was not one of my bigger plays, though, but uh, it just it was bad. It was one of those days. And then watch the UCF game and they, they looked like they were going to get an upset. I didn't touch that game at all. But Iowa State would actually win uh, pretty convincingly. And then uh, a lame pass interference call blew up that upset. So Cyclone's still undefeated. The NFL, though, didn't, didn't go well. 
Uh, so on a nice run there, hopefully that continues. And then Tuesday, the NBA tipped off. So now that's got my attention too. So lots to do. So you mentioned U- UCF, uh, KJ Jefferson. Is he back in the lineup there, Tony? You will not see KJ Jefferson in the lineup again. He you has, will not made, see him his, again. He has third, made his NIL money. He's, he's playing mentor. I'm not really sure what happened uh, in terms of, uh, you know, whether him and Malzahn had a falling out. Certainly his performance hasn't been there. But you would still say, oh, the, the window is open for him to be to to uh, you know step back in before his college career ends. I would say that that is not going to happen. So they've got uh, Jacory Brown, who will start, and then the kid who originally got the start, EJ Colson, true freshman. I think he'll play before Jefferson uh, sees another snap. So maybe they get him in there one more time for. Uh, for ceremonial reasons, but uh, for all intents and purposes, he is done as a starter. Good, good to know. Greg De Palma, our producer, Prime Sports Network. How was your week last week? The week was good. Uh, my wager on uh, Max Verstappen. I told everybody about the F1 wager worked out perfectly. So hopefully, everybody took advantage of that one. I don't give out Formula One wagers very often, so. Remember, he was down to uh, when I when I gave the pick, he was at minus two ten. Uh, yes. Then he went down to minus one forty five before the race on Sunday, and now he's at minus five hundred after one race. So, uh, hopefully, wow. everybody grabbed him when he did. Uh, I felt pretty good about it. So, uh, other than that, uh, another week, another jet loss. So my life uh, in the NFL continues to suck. <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and, but by the way, we talked about this last week. I would still, I have no idea why on earth the Jets were a two-point favorite over Pittsburgh last week. So I hope everybody took advantage of that. Uh, just mind-boggling. And I know you guys gave the reason. It's Aaron Rodgers, so I get it. But you know what? I've already, I don't usually like taking a look at odds until uh, the end of the week. But because it was the first game for next week, Thursday, I, 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 I scrolled a little bit too far into the Thursday game when I was looking at the Monday games this week and I saw the Jet Houston line and I was like, here we go again. How on earth are the Jets already considered, I think they were a one point favorite against Houston on Thursday in, in, in a week from now. How is that possible? I mean, well, come on. Because there's a lot of Greg De Palma, New York Jet lovers out there. And Aaron Rodgers, as you mentioned, now Devonta Adams for the football team. Everybody expects this team to be what they were supposed to be when they acquired Aaron Rodgers, and it's just not happened. Take advantage. Aaron Rodgers, Aaron Rodgers better known as the Great Destroyer. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, unbelievable. Wow. All Already right, guys. unpopular with some of his teammates for uh, – some of the criticisms that he uh, shared publicly. Yeah, well, right. he's he's not the most pleasant personality. I think we all know that. No, he's 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 a little bit testy. Yes, he is. That he is. And I want to remind all of our viewers and listeners out there to subscribe to the channel, if you will. We had a goal of reaching a thousand subscribers by the end of the football season. You are helping us get there. Do us a favor: hit the subscribe button and the like buttons to the show, and we'll know. Notify you when something when something's being posted here on the Playbook Experts YouTube channel. Do that. Thumbs up to you if you do. And before we get into the car this particular weekend, our Playbook Football Newsletter finally got to press late last night, but nonetheless it did. Uh, we had one of our writers was off, uh, and so yours truly had to assume double duty from a writing standpoint. But nonetheless, we got the job done, and it's available online at PlaybookSports.com. 18 pages. This week's football newsletter. And inside the newsletter, what are you going to find? How about how 6-0 and football teams in college football fare after their first loss of the season? What do they do in this bubble burst role? You'll find out in the newsletter this week. Also a college football home dog that is 13-0 to the spread in this week's home dog role. You can pick that up in the newsletter. Finally, in the National Football League, a team that's 11-0 against the spread against the opponent they're playing this weekend. These and a whole lot more are available in this week's copy of the Playbook Football Newsletter. I encourage you to download it now at playbooksports.com just in time for the football games this weekend. And before we get around the card here, guys, uh, special note here of what happened. We're broadcasting this on Thursday, what happened Wednesday night in college football. Another stunning upset. And arguably, this might be the biggest stunner of the year 
if for no other reason, when Liberty went down against Kennesaw State, I think most people would have safely bet Kennesaw State was not going to win a football game this year, let alone doing it as a 27-point underdog. But nonetheless, they pulled the cart out on Fat Cat Liberty. And the reason I'm calling this out is Liberty was indeed one of those 5-0 and Fat Cats who was nice and fat after a week of rest going into that football game. And what happened to them? Lo and behold, Kennesaw State, who was minus 118 in a point differential going into the football game. Liberty was plus 59. What do we have? Another 27-point straight-up dog winner. We've had them in the database, 38 teams that have won outright in our college football database as dogs of 27 or more points. The largest home dog that did just that was Texas El Paso, guys. They were a 36-point dog. BYU? They, mm -hmm. Yes, they did. Yep. Right? Good memory, Andy. BYU back in 1985. B UTEP was the guy that led the onslaught, I guess, per se, if they did. And uh, which leads me to this question. Now that Liberty is out of the race, and I don't think they were ever really truly in the uh, group of five race to make the college football playoff. And I can safely say that not because they lost, but because they were the only undefeated team in college football that was not in the top 25 poll. So a lot of the coaches and those who vote sort of saw what Liberty was all about this football season. But I'm going to ask everybody here, Tony Mejia, starting with you, uh, the college football group of five team that you feel will be playing in the college football playoff this year. Well, e easier to say after Friday, but it, it, my pick has been Boise State. It'll continue to be Boise State, especially if they survive UNLV, rematch of the Mountain West Championship game from last December. I think uh, there'll probably be more fans there than there was in that uh, Mountain West title game. So uh, we'll see if... Uh, UNLV fans will, will pack that place, but uh, I mean, I, I think it was only 30,000 that showed up in December, so they don't have that large a bar to clear. But uh, it's certainly one of the better football games for the weekend. Uh, and yeah, it's, uh, it's Ashton Genty. They're trying to solidify himself as the Heisman favorite. Cam Ward's in that mix as well from Miami. But uh, it's Boise to me. And just a quick note on this game. Look, Liberty, I, I, I bid on that as well because I, I had that as a 42-point uh, blowout for the Flames, and they've been doing this all season. Finally, I got a chance to really, really watch yesterday why this is happening because they struggled with New Mexico State, ECU, which has fired their coach. That, that was a battle into the fourth quarter. I think they were down for a while there. They played UTEP, who's terrible. They had the Appalachian State game um, postponed or actually completely canceled due to Hurricane Aline. They played FIU, went to overtime. Like, why is Liberty doing this? Considering they had, uh, you know, Salters considered uh, a late, uh, late uh, draft pick in, in, in the NFL. They've got great receivers. Their line is terrible, and the fact that they spend so much more money on facilities and everything else, they've got a pretty good coach in Shane Chadwell, um, and they lose to a first-year FBS member. That is uh, that is pretty terrible. One of the worst losses we'll see all season, no doubt. I think the upset of the year so far in college football. Yeah. Uh, Victor King, your thought about which team you feel out of the group of five is the strongest team as we speak today. Well, you, you know, guys, you, you first got to give credit to our military teams, right? When was the last time you saw two military teams in the top 25? We're talking about number 23 Army and number 24 Navy, 7-0 uh, and o Army, 6-0 and o Navy. Uh, so, they at least deserve some credit. Uh, there's also a um, team in that uh, AAC conference in Tulane who has a shot as well. And if it were up to me, a team that was in that conference last year who's had a fantastic season, the SMU Mustangs. Now, I know they're back in the Power Five. They're now an ACC team, so they're no longer a Group in Five team. But they deserve credit for an outstanding 6-1 and one season and the fact that they're averaging babies basically 46 points per game on offense since they made that quarterback change. But I'll waffle and I'll agree with Tony. And what I will say is that the Boise State UNLV winner on Friday night will come out naturally as my uh, best group of five team to make the playoffs. Should be an exciting game on Friday night. One more thing. The Friday night college football games this season have been absolutely electric. Very, very close games. Very, very high scoring games. And uh, if you've watched them, there has been some outstanding Friday night contests. 
And this game in Las Vegas on Friday night should be a barn burner. Boise State, two votes for the Broncos. Andy Isco, do you make it three, or how do you see other teams in the group of five faring maybe perhaps better than Boise State? Well, a couple of thoughts here. Uh, first of all, uh, Liberty last night, uh, excuse me, um, Kennesaw State last night was actually relatively shortly priced plus 1,600 on the money line. Uh, 20 years ago, they probably would have been close to plus 2,500 or higher at that same uh, point spread. And a great point. The, yeah, and the fact that they were in their first uh, season as the uh, as, a, a, as an FCS team, as an FBS team, excuse me. I, was, I still go back to 1A and 1AA. It was so much easier than trying to interpret the B and the C when it's really a lot of BS. And we all know that. But nonetheless. FBS. Uh, it, yeah. Uh, my, my issue with Tulane is, unfortunately, they have two losses outside of the conference, and that could hurt them because I think – well, uh, let, me, let me start this way. I, we missed you last night on Ken's show, Mark. But yes. uh, one of the things I talked about was the group of five because I had just gotten um, Greg's memo about next week in the in the college football poll, putting our top five group of five teams in there. And my first thought was that and this was after Liberty had 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 lost, I think, the night before, is that I still felt that Boise State had the best chance of being a one loss team being selected ahead of Liberty if Liberty did end up going unbeaten. Of course, we don't have that issue anymore. Part of the reason was Boise State's only loss this year was that competitive three-point loss at number one Oregon back in September. I think it was 38-35, 37-34, something like that. It was a three-point game that they lost. I agree with Tony. It could very well be the winner of tomorrow night's game between uh, Boise and UNLV. Um, Haven't played the game. Well, I'm I'm sorry for for Victor's... uh, um, Enjoyment. I played the over in that game. I got, uh, I think, I had 64 in that one. One thing about UNLV, well, a couple things. UNLV already played on a Friday night when they lost their only game, 44-41, Syracuse. in over to, to Syracuse in overtime. And that's important to note because, you know, UNLV never was really much of a program before last year when Barry Odom came in, a defensive coordinator at Arkansas, former uh, Missouri coach, and turned this team around. Now they did play Boise at the end of the year in the Mountain West Conference uh, championship game. And it was played here in Vegas, and Boise State won rather easily. I want to say it was like 42 to 20, like that, something like that. And I'm a little bit concerned that not all that much has changed. Now, you do have the Heisman Trophy candidate, maybe even the front runner on Boise right now. That could be a little bit difficult. Uh, UNLV's success early in the year was predicated largely on the defense. The offense was uh, the offense played well, but the defense was the weakness last year, and that defense has struggled so far this uh, the last two or three games. Where I'm headed to right here is I do think Boise State will win, okay, and they will be the clear front runner, especially if they go through the rest of the season unbeaten and end up uh, playing UNLV or some other team and win the Mountain West Conference championship. Victor brought up the other two teams that I was thinking about, Army and Navy. And there's the real possibility that we could see Army and Navy play in back-to-back weeks because they could end up playing oh, for the good, AAC yeah. championship, uh, I forget what it is, December 2nd, whatever the date, date is there. And then a week later, their traditional Army-Navy game, which is traditionally the last game of the college football season. So it could be very interesting, especially if Army and Navy end up unbeaten. Or their only losses are... Or to Notre Dame, who they've played the next few weeks. I think uh, Navy plays them this week, and Army plays them a little bit further down the road. So, so that those are not those would be non-conference losses. So Army and Navy could run the table in the AAC and meet for those two consecutive weeks. And that would be kind of interesting. But my long-winded way of answering your question is right now Boise State. He said Boise State, and <laughs> we've got him down for Boise State. That's three and zero. Oh. He, he broke down the entire nation to agree. Well, <laughs> I got to take the other side, guys. <laughs> I gotta take the other side. I'll go UNLV. Vic, oh, Jim's going UNLV for to to represent. I have to. I have to. You can't have this consensus. It can't be. <laughs> well, that, I'm, I'm betting the over rather than the game because I want to root for UNLV. Okay. That's the game, Greg De Palma. What's your vote? Best group of five team out there today. Well, I, I actually agree with Jim. I'm, I like UNLV tomorrow night. So I just think they're a much better team this year. Uh, they're much better on defense. They've been targeting this game all off season, And uh, 
I like him a lot. I think that Syracuse game loss had a lot to do with the emotion from the week before losing the quarterback, and it was inevitable. And they still almost won the game. So, <laughs> but um, I think Navy does have a real good shot because uh, if you take a look at the schedule, uh, they have really one conference tough game left, and that is home against Tulane. Tulane's got to play Navy and Memphis in back-to-back weeks. And then, of course, they would have to play the AAC championship game. So I kind of lean Navy as maybe the best chance. So it's it's Navy, UNLV. I'm going to go with UNLV. Um, but if they lose on Friday, then uh, I'm going to take Navy. Because I actually like Navy against Notre Dame anyway. To beat them? To beat them outright. It's one of my double-digit specials that we're going to talk about, Mark. Oh, oh boy. Oh boy. By, by the way... To, uh, Memphis is six and one overall with one conference loss. So if Memphis is the team that won, runs the table and ends up uh, being uh, what be eleven and one and winning the AAC championship, they would get some consideration as well. Sure. Especially uh, if well, if Boise loses to UNLV tomorrow night, and then there's a rematch in the Mountain West Championship game. And well, even if there's a loser, if there's a matchup between Boise and UNLV, the winner tomorrow loses and Memphis goes unbeaten, except for that one loss they already have. Memphis might be able to sneak in there and they'd be a fun team to watch because they don't play uh, great defense, but they sure do play good offense. And keep in mind, too, Army and Navy, of course, are both playing Notre Dame's, as you mentioned. So if one of them upsets Notre Dame and is sitting there, they've got a gr- they probably have the best win. Beating Notre Dame and it might the only be tough. problem with that is they would likely or possibly have to beat the other academy twice. Uh huh. Now, yeah. if, if Army or Navy beats Notre Dame, or if they both beat Notre Dame, then it would be then then Army and, and they play for the AAC championship because let's say Memphis has another conference loss there, maybe to Navy, that you would end up having that back to back games and you know, it'd be really interesting. Army beats Navy for the AAC. You'd, you'd almost have to root for Army to beat Navy in the Army-Navy game to see an undefeated uh, Army team or Navy team, whichever way it goes, uh, playing in the, the college football playoff. And then we'll have a new head coach at Notre Dame. Yeah. <laughs> if they lose to Army and Navy. and Not that it's bad Army and Navy teams, but if you lose to Army, Navy, and Northern Illinois in the same year, I just don't think that's going to cut it for Notre Dame. Yeah, I didn't think about that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Bye-bye, Marcus, right? Yeah, really. Hello, goodbye, Marcus. Exactly. Hey, everybody, you're tuned in to Mark Lawrence Against the Spread, the nation's most popular sports handicapping talk show. I'm talking with some of the sharpest experts in all of football wagering on the show here today. And be, we're going to get into both the NFL and college football games of the week. And, Andy, I'm going to ask you, before we get over to the NFL side of things, if you had any sort of an update from the Survivor Contest, I won't put you on the spot here just yet, but uh, I will mention that to you just before we get to our NFL Game of the Week. Let's go over to the college football side of things this week, guys. And I think one might safely say, and I don't know where college game day is this Saturday, but I wouldn't be at all surprised to see if they don't show up in College Station when Texas A&M hosts LSU. That has to be the spot, I would guess. They're in Indiana. Uh, yeah, Indiana. Right. Indiana, yes, exactly. Uh, <laughs> but I don't know if they'd go there with uh, with the quarterback being out. But no, and nonetheless, they don't they don't predicate where they go on injuries. They just go for wherever the attraction is. And we're going to go us to the Southeast Conference to LSU, Texas A and M. And uh, before I hand it off to the guys here, a couple of notes that I have here on the game, and I'll then I'll we'll go around the lock on this particular football game. I'm a little bit perplexed and torn because. Uh, out of my database and out of my system book is one of the best systems that is out there and it applies to Texas A&M. And what it largely amounts to is Texas A&M is the only team in college football this year that returns 17 or more starters for the second consecutive year in a row. And teams who do just that, when they do have a revenge chip on their shoulder, do really rather well in games like this, which is the role A&M will be in this particular week against LSU. Uh, my problem, though, is this. If you take a look at what's going on in the SEC this year, this football season, since they've expanded to 16 teams, it's been a haven for Road Dogs SEC teams. 14-3 mm-hmm. to the spread overall, 13-2 and two when they're playing in conference games. That's pretty strong numbers to have to step in front of, and I'm electing not to do just that 
I'm going to run with the dog in this football game, the good quality dog. You've also got A&M, who started a little bit slow and appears to be coming on. But a little cautionary note, the last nine times in the series, when they've played LSU, when they've been off back-to-back wins, A&M's lost the money all nine times. I'm going to bite for the quality dog here, the pedigree dog in LSU. With that, I'm going to throw it back to Tony Mejia. And how do you size this game up, Tony, LSU, Texas, A&M? Well, I, I had my trusty phone. So college game days in Bloomington. I think Greg was right on that. That's what he said. I don't know if he was oh, guessing. Bloomington? But, uh, yeah, in, in Bloomington, in Indiana. And uh, Kyle Schwarber will be your guest picker. So oh, really? he's got nothing to do now. Uh, but uh, so that is. I guess uh, he'll be the is, leadoff picker, huh? What, yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's what ESPN's got going on. I, I didn't check uh, the, the Fox show, which is pretty good now. Um, but uh, they may be uh, on College Station. But yeah, I, I looked at this matchup early in the week. Got to go back and, and uh, revisit it before I, I lock in this prediction. But uh, my early week play is on the under here. Um, teams have split the last six minutes and uh, last six meetings. Underdog is uh, 3-0-1 against the number uh, over the last four. And uh, like you mentioned, there's a lot of continuity in place for uh, A&M outside of getting Mike Elko to be their head coach this season. And uh, I mean, even even still, that, that loss to Notre Dame in the opener, uh, they had their chances. Uh, Wegman played a, a poor game and then Wegman got hurt. And uh, he has not looked great, at least last week in, in his return. Um, you know, put the ball at risk. I, the uh, numbers that I look at, uh, he put uh, the ball at risk to be intercepted four times against Mississippi State. Uh, so I'm pretty sure that Mike Elko will, will tell his coordinator uh, and play caller, let's, let's make sure that we don't have him lose this game. Um, and then LSU, you, know, you got Garrett Nussmeyer who's done a really nice job replacing Jaden Daniels, but uh, not necessarily very accurate. Uh, he made some huge throws to lead that comeback against uh, Ole Miss. But, uh, you know, I, I think he goes in uh, up against arguably the best defense that he's seen to date. So I just think, uh, you know, both teams will be very cautious in this one, want to be around to try to steal it in the fourth quarter. That leads me to the under here. And the, the no- number I had was 53 and a half. Um, you know, we'll, we'll see if uh, if Marcel Reed ends up replacing Wegman if he's ineffective. Uh, I think that's entirely possible. Uh, but yes, uh, to, to me, I think you, you go on the road if you're LSU, you're you're in front of over a hundred thousand people. You've got uh, a, a, your your most uh, reliable running back is a true freshman, and yes, he can absolutely run the ball. He's been really good. Uh, but can he pick up a blitz? This is going to be a very uh, dynamic defense that disguises things. Uh, so I think uh, if you're Brian Kelly, you don't want to let uh, Nussmeyer lose this either. So both coaches will lean on their defenses. Under is the play for me. And as far as who wins the game, uh, I'm slight lean to A&M if they have the ball last at home. Victor King, Tony likes the under. Do your numbers true up that way? Or if not, why? And uh, who it is that you actually like in this football game between the Aggies and the Tigers? Uh, I'm going to respectfully disagree with Tony a little bit. Obviously, this game has got the makings of a early college football playoff game. That's for sure. I mean, the loser could still what run the table and go ten and two with still a little bit of luck in the game. And obviously, it's a good game that Mark chose. It's easily one of the most intense games of the entire weekend. Uh, what's got me thinking over is the fact that A&M has not really faced too many high-powered passing teams yet this season, and I do think this will be the first time that the Aggies will be hit uh, pretty hard through the air. We know what Kelly does with quarterbacks at LSU. Um, They are second in the SEC in passing, right behind Ole Miss, thanks to that bomber of uh, Garrett Nussmeyer. Uh, With that said, LSU is still on a four-game under streak, so – Tony's thoughts on the under, I I can't totally disagree with, but I'll say this. I believe that's what's keeping the line of this game in the low to mid 50s. If they were not on a four game under streak, we may see a line in the high 50s in this particular. Uh, The Aggies, uh, Connor uh, Wegman is a little bit of a bomber himself. I think he's probably a better pro prospect than Nussmeyer as well. Uh, Size, arm, mobility. 
Uh, he has bounced back off that rocky start and his injury. He was almost perfect against Missouri. We won't talk about the four interceptions against Mississippi State. That is for sure. Uh, what's got me leaning over is the fact that the line is still 53 and a half to 54. And both 54 and 55 are key numbers in college football. So if you can find a line of 53 and a half or less, I'll play what's happened in the last three years. All three times these teams have played each other, they all three went over the total in the last three seasons. And by an average margin of more than a touchdown a game, plus 8.3 against his 54 and 55 is a key number. I still think there's a little bit of value on the over if you can find a line at 54, maybe 53 and a half. Victor leans over this total in this football game. He and Tony going head-to-head in this football contest for opinions in the game. Uh, Jim Feist, I know college football is not your, uh, not in your wheelhouse, but anything you've heard from anybody in your contacts about this big football game, and if not, no problem at all. I just thought I'd run it by you. Well, I appreciate that. No, I have not. Um, I've, I've been trying to um, – I feel like I'm part of a mash unit over here trying to get through all these injuries in the NFL. <laughs> I just got a notice that Puka Nakua and Cooper Cup will play tonight. Wow. Yeah, it's a big, big, big yes. boost for the Rams, no Late question. breaking probably. information. Thank you, Jim. Yes, really, really good. And by yeah. the way, I've seen the line go down to two and a half at a number mm. of books. Yeah, maybe, see if maybe you can find a, a three out there if you can do it. Yeah. It's, they, it'll drop definitely. Wow, they 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 will or will not play. What did you say, Jim? They will. They will. Okay. They, they yeah. will play. Okay. They both. They both will play according to this update I just got. Unfortunately, they play on the offense side of the ball and not the <laughs> defensive side of the ball for the Rams. Yeah, where the <laughs> yeah. is the big surprise there because well, that might, yeah, that might yeah, give cut. you that might give, the Victor. What do you think? Does that lean you to the the guy that knows? Lean it to the over a little bit? No, I don't like the line move. It was, what, 45 and a half, 46, all the way up to 48, 48 and a half. Uh, I know that non-divisional road favorites on Thursday night games have gone like 85% under the total in the last three or four years. Uh, I am still probably, if I'm going to bet it, bet the under in the game. You, you, you can't fault that Minnesota defense, particularly after allowing a lot of points against Detroit last week. Uh, they could really uh, put the hammer down on the Rams tonight. My my biggest concern in the game, uh, and we're hopping from college football to the yeah. NFL, but on to Jim's topic matter here for, just for the moment, is uh, I'm looking at this Minnesota team, and I'm trying my best to like this football team. I know they, they, they did a lot of good things early on, but I'm, <laughs> but I'm seeing this football team beginning to unravel, statistically at least. They've been out-yarded four straight football games in a row and they're coming off their first loss of the football season here. Now they're going to still continue to keep being priced as the undefeated team they were. Hence, we're seeing them road chalk against the Rams here tonight. Uh, but I think if they show poorly here, I think you're going to see Minnesota, the, the line value or the line power rating on this team being adjusted after tonight's football game. Andy, how do you see uh, our particular game that we're talking about this week? Well, if you take a look at how these teams are coming into this game, I could make a case that a um, and was in a little bit of a look-ahead spot last week. They were huge favorites over uh, Mississippi State on the road. They didn't play all that well, but they were coming off of that 41-10 home blasting of then unbeaten Missouri, and that game itself followed the uh, close game where they had a struggle against uh, Arkansas down in Dallas. So it was a flat spot for them knowing that they had LSU on deck, which was arguably going to be one of the two remaining tests that they have this season. The, the last one being, uh, I think it's, uh, is it the week uh, before? I think maybe it's Thanksgiving week. I'm not sure. So I think it's the one of the last games of the year uh, when they play, when they host Texas in the uh, uh, SEC. Uh, as far as LSU is concerned, it's they this week that may be in somewhat of a little bit of a letdown spot following their huge win two weeks ago uh, against Ole Miss. And then, uh, their uh, their play last week. Uh, so I, I wonder if, um, if if A&M might not be in a spot that they know how to deal with after having the uh, uh, situation last week occur for them. Uh, LSU, of course, uh, 
as I mentioned, came off that big win. And then uh, last week they had a surprisingly easier than expected win against Arkansas. Maybe that tempers it a little bit as far as a negative for LSU, but still uh, we're now being asked to win a second straight SEC road game. And I know you mentioned the stats about underdogs, especially road underdogs this year. I think at a line of two and a half, I have to back uh, a and uh, This is a key game as far as making it to the championship game, uh, especially with uh, A&M still having that tough game ahead against uh, uh, Texas. They, you know, if they if they end up with one loss, and that might be the Texas loss, it could be the LSU loss, they may still get to play for the SEC title with the other teams starting to accumulate losses as well. Little Georgia's still out there with uh, with that one loss. So I like A and M in this spot, certainly laying two and a half. By the way, I liked what you put in the uh, coffee club the other day about Indiana and Alabama. Yes. Yep. Uh, you you know, may want to share with the folks because it is quite interesting. But run it by me because uh, right now I'm I'm right I, out I of the. Newsletter I think from it was yeah, it, it was something along the lines of how strange is it to see? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Indiana ranked above Alabama in football, and Alabama ranked ahead of Indiana in basketball. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's sort of a twist, a, a odd twist, I'd say, <laughs> to say the least. But that's the kind of year it's been so far for each of those two teams. Alabama really suff struggling, suffering right now, and Indiana having. My goodness, the best year, arguably, we've known in memory from the Hoosiers here. I'm just curious. Uh, Tony, have you heard whether or not uh, uh, Rourke is going to quarterback for Indiana this week? I know he has that thumb issue, that problem. Have you heard any word about his injury status? Because that line is not moving. I don't think he is last I saw, but I'll check on it for you in a second. Yeah, I, I thought I heard earlier this morning as well that he was going to be sitting out this week. I believe he's out. It's, it, it, but, so what he follows me is why hasn't the line not moved? I just uh, maybe unless that's they they opened the lineup with anticipation that he was going to be out. I, you know, I'm not quite sure about that. Also, guys, you know, welcome to the top 25 is due to the Commodores of Vanderbilt. I mean, it's been a long time. We've piled on against this team for 10, 15 years now. So, uh, with that win last week against Ball State, they are now in the top 25. The Vanderbilt Commodores at five and two on the season. Good for them. Uh, it's well, a good, by the way, good story. Well, welcome to the top 25 Vanderbilt. You get to play Texas <laughs> off a loss this week. <laughs> <laughs> Oops, not for long. But Texas is in a bubble burst role, Andy. Remember that, okay? Yep. We'll see whether or not they come flat to the game. I kind of would lean to Vanderbilt in this game. but Yeah, I think, look, Vanderbilt is getting disrespected. And, yes. I mean, look, at, I, I think part of it is because they had that loss to Georgia State. And I think people are looking right. at that as the old Vanderbilt, but – you lose at Missouri in overtime. You beat Alabama. You know, beat you, Kentucky on the road. Yeah, I you mean, beat come Virginia on. Virginia Tech to start the season. Yes, that, that win looks even better considering how well Virginia Tech has played over the last month. And and just who has Texas played? I mean, oh, they beat Michigan. Who hasn't lately? You know, I mean, Texas's biggest wins this year have not been over teams that have actually played all that well. So, yeah, I, I just think that line is a little bit disrespected. But understanding, I understand it, but take advantage of it. And they're a 7-1 to one money line play. Hey, Greg, let's be honest here. Uh, we have to share this with people here that uh, the Our Lads uh, Network, that which Greg does a show and I, I participate on the show with him, uh, ourlads.com, a great, great football resource. Uh, so, Andy, I, Greg, we participate in their weekly top 12 ratings of college football teams, and we submit them every Monday. And I submitted mine, and then Greg texts back to me. He says, I see you did not have Texas in your top 12. Neither did I. And my answer was, well, that was a complete foo paw on my part. I completely fell asleep at the switch on that one. I did and that earlier this season. <laughs> did you? <laughs> Same team. Same, yeah, that's what I mean. Yes, yeah, Texas, yeah. But Greg, you know, Greg said he, he, he was well aware of it and he didn't put Texas in the in the top 12. So, you know, there's notice, there's notice, by the way, that Greg did not uh, comment to either of us that we did not put Alabama in the top 12. No, we didn't. And nor did the coaches or the uh, the writers. No. They didn't get any points in our poll. Nobody. No. no. Nobody touched no. them. No. Why would they? They've lost. Yeah. Taven Jackson will start for Indiana, by the way. I'm sorry? Taven Jackson will start for Indiana. That's. Oh, yeah. no okay. Well, that's official then. But. Well, don't you think that that's the reason why the odds started out at six and a half? I, yes. I mean, yes. Yeah. Because, and I thought I had, I had seen. There's, there's no way that that 
work being out isn't already baked in. Yeah. yeah and right. I don't I don't think they would have been unless there was some place that put up games of the year lines on every game. I don't think Indiana Washington would have been one of the games that would have been highlighted over the summer. Hey guys, you're tuned in to Mark Lawrence against the spread, the nation's most popular sports handicapping talk show. We're going to shift things over to the National Football League side of things with our NFL game of the week. We're going to get into the Dallas Cowboys San Francisco 49er game in just a moment here. But before we do, uh, I got a little update here for what we talked about, largely about last week about the collapse that home dogs suffered two weeks ago when they were 0 9 straight up and against the spread. Last week, if you would have if you would have snapped the rubber band, mortgaged the house, and bet those home underdogs, you'd probably be looking for a, a place to rent this particular week. <laughs> <laughs> they went two and four straight up and against the spread last week, so they're on a bad roll this year. In fact, you, you need a new uh, rubber band. Yes, you do. <laughs> There's no more snapping involved there. Uh, Mark, if you if you got, I want to ask a question to your database guys. Yes. I'm just looking. I don't know why you were talking college football. I, I was just looking at the schedule for Minnesota going forward. Their next, their next um, five games, four of them are on the road, and four games in a row beginning tonight are all non-division games. Isn't that something unusual in the yeah, schedule? Yeah, it's, it, it's a bit unusual, especially for a team that may have a focus issue here right now. Situation being what it was, having that perfect season run. Now, can they can they regain their focus in these four non-division games? A lot of them on the road. You know, when the dust settles and you say, "What happened to Minnesota?" What you call out here, Jim, might be a big, big factor in all that in all that doing about Minnesota. I, I think I'm not quite part sure of the how to why read they might. That. That's why I'm asking. What what is that? Does the database say something about this? I've I've not seen anything like this, really. Four out of five games on the road, none of them division games. I was going to say that I think part of it is that they are non-division games, but because of Chicago, Green Bay, and Detroit's success, Minnesota needs to focus and build up wins for the times. They still have five more division games to go after the uh, 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 four more more they have because they already played Detroit and Green Bay. And the fact that all three of those teams are at least two games over 500, Minnesota can't afford to lose the games that they should be able to win only because – they're not going to go unbeaten in those conferences. That, that is a very game. difficult division that they're in, for yeah. sure. Yeah. You know, isn't it ironic, guys, that when the football season began, everybody was just in love with and lauding the AFC North being the strongest oh, yeah. division in the National Football League? You know, who is it today? It's the NFC North. Uh, right. And I broke these divisions down before the show here just to show you how strong they've been. These are the records, the outright records of uh, teams in each division. And how many of these teams in those divisions have winning records? In the AFC East, they're 10 and 17 overall. One team has a winning record. The AFC Central, the highly lauded AFC Central, just 14 and 14 overall, two winning teams. The AFC South, 12 and 15 overall with two winning teams. And the AFC West, sneakily good this year, 16 and 11 outright with one winning team. Over on the NFC East side of things, the NFC East, 14 and 12 overall with two winning teams. The NFC North, what a season they've had. 19 and 6 overall, these teams. All four teams have winning records. Wow. In the NFC South, it's 11 and 17 with two winning teams. And the NFC West, 12 and 15 with one winning team. So, tip of the hat to the NFC North. Uh, they've really taken the spot away from the AFC North thus far this football season here. So, just a little interjection about what's going on with that particular. Yeah, one thing I'll add to that, Mark, because you mentioned the record, what, 19 and 6? That yes. includes two division games. So the division is 17 and 4 against non division teams. And when uh, one of the things I like to look at as I'm evaluating strength of schedule, et cetera, is I do like to look at the records of these divisions if you exclude games within the division, because obviously for each game within the division, there's going to be one winner and one loser. But against a non division team, uh, it's either going to be one win or one loss for a specific team. So when you're looking at uh, what I say, 19 and, uh, 19 and 6, 17 and 4, that's what's incredibly inc- impressive. That's what? That's better than uh, 75% outside the division. Don't know that that will be sustained, but it is another reason to give additional credit to all four teams beyond just their winning record because the majority of the reason why they have that winning record is because they've had outstanding success 
playing someone other than another division. Yeah, that's a great that's a great uh, great overview on that, Andy. Here because uh, when you're looking at the situations like that and you're counting teams' records and they do play one another, you can take those games out and see what the true record happens to be. And you ask yourself, well, that 17 and four sustain in the NFC North? No way on God's green earth will that sustain. Uh, nothing seven is going to be 17 and four and keep going on. It doesn't matter whether it's the teams, the divisions, a trend or whatever it is, it just isn't going to happen because the return to the norm, the law of averages is going to reach out and say, Hey, come on back here, guys. You're getting a little out of, getting a little out of hand here. And I think that's so, so talk, talking about divisions. When you look at the NFC West, everyone thought in the beginning it would be San Francisco and they'd possibly go back to the Super Bowl. Well, they're struggling because of, Mostly because of a lot of injuries. Super Bowl injuries. jinx. But but Seattle's in Seattle's in the mix. San Francisco's in the mix. The Rams are in the mix. There's only one game difference. So the Rams getting these players back tonight, they are legitimate contenders to win that division. Yeah, like you say, Jim, uh, just one loss behind the leader here. That's you know keeps them viable, and you know they're arguably the two best. You might even say the two best players on the team, you know, Matthew Stafford probably takes a back seat. He's got to deliver the goods. But, you know, those are two Pro Bowl wide receivers here and a uh, big, big shot in the arm for the Rams. And in theory, this could also have wild card implications going head to head with a Minnesota team that might be in contention for a wild card. Now, the Rams do have some ground to make up, but that is another important factor that could come into play at the end of the season. If, let's say, the Rams don't win the NFC West, but let's say they end up 10 and 7. Uh, which is a, a potential wild card record. Minnesota, because of the division that they're in, they still have, I said, those four more division games and those non-division games as well, that they could also be 10-7. and seven. So this, this could, even though it doesn't look like it now, it could very much have wild card implications. You know, By the way, if you want to Another great point you mentioned there is uh, uh, look at the teams the Rams are going to have to play and identify the key games, you know, the games that are going to involve whether or not they'll make the playoffs because – those will become doubly important to them. Uh, division games, obviously, of double importance, but other teams that are in the division race, the chase that they're into, those also become much like division games to this team, a team that's looking to make up ground and can't afford losses in games like that. So there's a lot of planning and scheming for things like this, but mm. I think you're onto the right thing here, Jim. I think the Rams could be a viable look here. Uh, especially if these players stay healthy and they do and they, and they do meld into the lineup, uh, much like we're expecting them to do. On the flip side, guys, if they lose on the Thursday night game, they fall a two and five, and tonight could actually be Cooper Cup's last game as a Ram. Yep. You've heard the trade rumors yep. all week long all about true. about Cooper Cup being traded. Not only that, but there are even some small rumors out there about. Matt Stafford being available for trade as well. You know, instead of taking the Rams, if you like them tonight, you know what I would do? I would take the Rams right now at 100 to 1 to win the Super Bowl. Because if they win the game tonight, they're still going to be in it. Maybe they'll get on a run, like you guys said. Uh, Mark, you like them in the beginning of the year as a Super yes, Bowl contender. So if they get on that type of run, 100 to 1 is a steal right now. So, but of course, they got to win tonight. I saw an in, an insider tweeted out. And I don't know. I doubt him, but I don't remember who it was. They said, uh, "Well, Sam Darnold's in a bit of a pickle because if uh, if Matthew Staff if he beats Matthew Stafford, it, it kind of increases the probability that the Rams would trade him. It's like, well, what is he going to do? Lay down and, and and have the Rams win that game so he can keep his job long term? That's silly. But yeah. Uh, yeah, certainly. I mean, the Bucks obviously need a receiver now." Uh, and uh, they were looking at, so just you because know, you, are, off the you table, also have to consider to some of these players have have uh, no trade contracts and Stafford being a veteran. I'm not too sure that his wife would want to uproot again uh, after and she has a big say. Ability. She, well, of course, she she had the brain tumor years ago. It was a big yeah. that was a big deal. They're settled in L.A. They have a lot of money. Uh, you know, they could nix that really easily. You might not get away with Cooper Cup probably doesn't have that in his contract, but a Matthew Stafford might have it in his contract. Yeah, especially Minnesota. No, and, and again, I, I would think that that's more far-fetched of the rumor than, than Cooper Cup, who certainly probably is likely to be on the move if they lose this game. I think the Chiefs balked at, at uh, you know, the cost of it. 
the cost efficiency was better to go Hopkins than right. otherwise the Cup would be in Kansas City. But again, you know, they're they're more than just the Bucks and Chiefs looking for a wide receiver help at the moment. Well, guys, we're speaking about the NFC West. Let's do this. Let's tear down our NFL game of the week, and we're going to hop onto the San Francisco 49ers this week mm. when they take on the Dallas Cowboys and uh, a matchup of two teams that were potential Super Bowl prospects that are really struggling right now at the moment. Two very disappointing teams, both each badly in need of a win. Andy, what do you see happening in this Cowboys 49ers football game? I wouldn't be surprised if Dallas comes in, plays a good game, and actually pulls the upset. We've seen San Francisco be very vulnerable. Jim mentioned the reasons largely due to injuries really on both sides of the football, especially on the offense. And we still don't know when McCaffrey's coming back. Uh, Debo Samuel is a uh, uh, what he had, no, I think what was he had pneumonia or something, but he should be recovered off that, but still not necessarily be a hundred percent. Dallas coming off of that embarrassing loss to Detroit after that uh, nice late win over Pittsburgh. You know, think of Dallas this year after that great home record they accumulated the past couple of years, 0 and 3 at home, but 3 and 0 straight up on the road this year. San Francisco clearly not the team that they were. Yeah, and Greg mentioned Super Bowl jinx and all that. Yeah, that's part of it. But I think the better part is what Jim said. It's all the injuries. You're constantly shuffling your lineups. You're constantly making changes uh, personnel-wise from game to game. Dallas, the, you know, I wrote up two games. Two of the four games I wrote up this week began with almost the same line. In the Chicago-Washington game, I said, often the buys come at the absolute wrong time. And that's for Chicago because of how well they've been playing. The next write-up, buys often come at absolutely the right time. And that's the case with Dallas. They needed this time off. They had not been playing well. They've certainly yeah. been underperforming the talent. And there's a good chance they'll get Micah Parsons back on uh, defense. Certainly, I will be taking the points, and part of it will be on the money line. In fact, I believe I wrote that I expect Dallas to win this game. Two great points, Andy, about the buys and when they come, and it couldn't be you, you couldn't epitomize it anymore. Dallas needing the buys and Chicago not needing the buys. It's a momentum breaker for the Bears, and you know the Cowboys can use all the help they can get. So... Uh, I'm with you with uh, Dallas in this football game here. I'm taking a look at the football matchup, and, you know, what I'm seeing in the game is uh, Dallas is off the humiliating loss, not a bad loss, a humiliating loss. In fact, they've only eight times lost games by 30 or more points. This is in our database going back to 19. Oh, and by, and by the way, yeah. second humiliating loss at home this season. Remember the Saints. Yes, the Saints. exactly. This game, they come in off a 30-plus point loss. They are six and two straight up and seven and one to the spread, bouncing back off losses of thirty or more points. And you've got Mike McCarthy, who himself owns a pretty dandy little week of rest record here. Andy Reid gets all the all the kudos and all the love, but Mike McCarthy, thirteen and seven straight up and fourteen five and one to the spread with a week of rest during the regular season. Nice numbers for McCarthy that way. And San Francisco, you mentioned Andy struggling. We all know about their woes and the reasons why they've really been not all that well as a home favorite, even when they've been healthy, but they're not healthy, but home favorites against teams off a loss. They're just three and 11 to the spread San Francisco. So, yeah. Wow. I'll be with you, Andy. I'll take the points with the Cowboys. I think you're going to find a very hungry Dallas Cowboy football team coming in here. Victor, how do you see this breakup shaking down? Well, I'll hit it for the over under angle. And for me, it's one of my favorite unders of the week. I got it in. At the opener of 48.0, the last time I looked, it was already down to, what, 46.0, maybe some 46 and a half. We're still good there as long as we can cover the 44 and the 45. But the timing is right for this one. We know both teams are down in offensive scoring. Compared to last year, the Niners are down three and a half points per game. Dallas is down nine points per game on offense compared to last year. Let's not forget the recent tendencies of the NBC TV Sunday night games. Last season, Sunday night games went 5 and 12 over under, only 40.3 combined points per game. And guess what? This season, there's been seven Sunday night games, one over, six unders, only 39.3 points per game. The only Sunday nighter that's gone over was the most recent one last week, the Jets and the uh, Steelers. So Sunday night games, for some strange reason, have been very, very low scoring now over the last year and a half. Now, again, you mentioned the fact that Dallas got torched at home 
when they allowed, what, 46 points to the Lions. Here's a great 1-15 over under out of the database. Any Sunday team who allowed 45 or more points at home in their last game when the over-under is 53 or less, 1-15 and 15 over-under over the last five years, that applies to the Cowboys. In addition, with Dallas off their bye week as well, NFL Road Dogs, after their bye week, have gone 5-25 and 25 over-under in the last four years, 1-13 and 13 over-under in the last two years. So I think there's still value on the under, both teams struggling. As you guys mentioned, Dallas is getting a couple of key uh, pieces back on defense, like Micah Parsons as well. So there's still one. plenty of time to play the under in this game. One thing that I won't do is when I bet a nighttime game under the total, I don't watch it on TV because uh, you, you're, you're asking for trouble. It's like watching a game for three hours with a punch to your gut. or what you, I don't call, wanna, you want to ruin your sleep. Right, you know, or, or, or watching a game for three hours with a really, really tight sphincter when you bet an under and you watch it on TV for three hours. So bet the under, do something nice with the wife on Sunday night, and then cash your winner on the under. And just, just occasionally check your phone for scores. That's all you need to that's, do. That's all you need to do, right. And, so, and sorry, Greg, but when I want to watch a Jet game, it's because I want to fall asleep. <laughs> oh, the whipped cream on the cake right there. Oh. And I'm, a, I'm a long suffering. Yeah. Emphasis on the long and You're excited this year. Come on, Andy. Yeah, I mean, they just had three, like, down to the wire games before last week. Come on. Right. <laughs> well, since Andy threw that at you, Greg, I'm going to throw this back to you then, San Francisco, Dallas. And uh, any retort to Andy about the Jets is all up to you. But how do you see the Cowboys and the Niners this week? Well, I actually want to use my time to talk about uh, last week's easy stealing pick with the Kansas City Chiefs doing it again as a road dog. And uh, talk about disrespect. San Francisco, that line, I was looking at the line late, and that line went up to two and a half a little bit before kickoff. Two and a half. It kept going up. People kept, I guess, putting money on the Niners, unless it was some sort of reverse psychology by the sports book. But, uh, and now San Francisco is a four point favorite over Dallas. I mean, what, what's, you know, this is where we need a lines maker to try to understand a theory between San Francisco being only a one and a half point difference favorite over San Fr over, uh, Dallas to a uh, Kansas city. But anyway, uh, I agree. I think Dallas, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go with you guys. I'm going to take Dallas. Uh, I think this is a good money line play. Try to take advantage of that. It's like what, plus 170 around there, 165? So might as well go ahead and take advantage of that because San Francisco is in a really big mess right now with all the injuries. And I just, uh, I agree with you guys. I think Dallas coming off the bye, they have a lot to prove. Tony Mejia, how, what do you see in this big matchup here? If this, uh, this has got the beginning of the football season here, it had NFC championship game potential written all over it. Uh, not right now as they're playing. And last week, the oddity, I think of all oddities that we saw in the San Francisco football game was uh, between the two quarterbacks, uh, Brock Purdy uh, and uh, Patrick Mahomes. They had zero touchdown passes and five picks. I mean, who would have ever thought that? My goodness. What do you see happening here, Tony? Well, for, for starters, the Micah Parsons uh, will he or won't he uh, ordeal will go down to Saturday because McCarthy basically said if he doesn't practice by Saturday, then he won't play and he hasn't practiced yet. And it's an ankle. So it's a threshold thing, according to McCarthy. Uh, and obviously that changes a ton. I'll, I'll tell you what, if, if Parsons doesn't play, I'll be on the 49ers. But, uh, you, you know, you guys talk Super Bowl jinx. I think I, I, I might have openly laughed and if I didn't and it was internal when you guys were trying to pitch me on somebody else to win the <laughs> NFC West <laughs> outside of the 49ers. So I do believe in jinxes, but I don't believe in Super Bowl jinxes. And, uh, and you know, lo and behold, I mean, we've got Brandon Ayuk now out with a torn ACL and torn MCL. McCaffrey, you know, when he does come back, I don't think he's going to be the same Christian McCaffrey. Uh, you know, they, they did get Hafunga back. They, they've had issues on both sides of the ball injury-wise. And those two awful losses, which might end up haunting them, uh, double-digit leads against the Rams and the Cardinals, and you blow them both, and all of a sudden the division's wide open. So certainly this is a game that they need badly. Uh, you know, I, I'm stunned that not only did Mike McCarthy keep his job, but Jerry Jones 
essentially said he was never in danger of it, never crossed his mind. I mean, it was on the man's birthday, for Christ's sake, and, and the, the Cowboys no-showed uh, the way they did against the Lions, who essentially ran up the score and embarrassed them. So uh, here we go. We've got a, a vote of confidence for Dallas players, but if, if Parsons doesn't play, I want nothing to do with it, but I will give out a play. And, you know, player props at this point – you can bet them they're readily available. It isn't a decade ago where you had to find a book that, that would book them. So I love, and I mean, L-O-V-E love both Brock Purdy and, uh, and Dak Prescott to throw an interception in this game. And so that's the number is a half. So will they or won't they throw a pick? I think uh, Prescott is minus 125 and Purdy's at minus 105. But you got Purdy coming off a three interception game. He's only thrown uh, more than that once in his short career. And you've got Prescott, who has thrown multiple interceptions in both October games. So you've got – you throw in the fact that it doesn't seem like C.D. Lamb has been in sync. Maybe they'll work that out over the bye. Certainly no number two receiver has stepped up with Cooks in and out of the lineup. And then obviously the 49ers, you've got Debo Samuel trying to get back from pneumonia. doesn't know if he will or won't. Uh, Jawan Jennings missed last week's game against the Chiefs with the hip thing. Obviously you got no IU. Uh, so they've got rookies, uh, Jacob Cowing. And, uh, and Pearsall, who will play prominent roles going forward if they don't go out and get somebody. So uh, to me, uh, continuity will not be in place. Give me a pick for both of those guys. So, I like that. Real quick, you can get anywhere from about three to one, maybe even seven to two odds on both quarterbacks to throw an INT in the game. I like that, Tony. Well, I like that, too. If, you like, if you're into props. Good observation by Tony here. I've saved the best for last in this football game. We haven't heard a lot from Jim Feist on the show because we've been talking about a lot of college football. But now we're into Jim's wheelhouse. And we're talking about Dallas and San Francisco. Jim Feist, Las Vegas, what do you see in this football game? I hate betting on Jerry Jones, but I'm going to have to in this spot. (laughs) Um, (laughs) I mean, they had the bye week coming off the embarrassment potential of getting Parsons back. Um, one of the things that I've noticed in the Dallas losses is they cannot stop the run. And they've been crushed by teams that run the ball as well as they do. And they have been, and it's been ugly. I don't see, I don't see that happening here. Um, and I think with the extra preparation time, the embarrassment, everything that's gone on with this, and these new fresh injury issues with San Francisco, I think the Niners are in, in real trouble. At least, I mean, there's still 10 games left in the season, so it's not like we're done. But and a lot of things can happen. They get these players back, and a lot of things can happen. But but they're in a tough division. Dallas has who do they have in their division to beat? The Eagles are playing terrible. Washington has no defense, and now Daniels is a little banged up. So there's not a lot of in the Giants. Of course, are garbage, but so. Dallas is still looking at a, a real chance of winning this division that they're in where the Niners are running into some teams that might actually beat them. Huh? Legitimately, the Rams in Seattle are not bad. And um, I think the Cowboys are going to actually win this game straight up. Jim Weiss and the Dallas Cowboys. As is the by, by the way, Dallas yes. will literally be hungry for this game because coming off of the pie, and everyone remembers the game two weeks ago, Unless they use DoorDash or Grubhub, the players and their wives could not have gone grocery shopping the past two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> the point I never thought of. I don't know who writes Andy's stuff, but I know one thing. It's good, and it, nobody does. It's Andy. It's AI. <laughs> really, good, really good stuff here, guys. Well, that's our breakdown of the what we feel is the game of the week in the National Football League. This week, Dallas and San Francisco. Before I turn it over to Greg DePalma uh, for around the horn questions that Greg has to add, wants to ask of us, I want to remind everybody, if you haven't done so yet, you have to download your copy of the Playbook Totals Tip Sheet Newsletter. On a winning run here right now, winning seasons in 14 of the last 17 years, get your copy of the Playbook Totals Tip Sheet. Just log on at playbooksports.com, pick up your copy this weekend, and put yourself in the winner circle this weekend with your over-under total plays. Greg De Palma, I'm going to ha- hand it off to you here now, and you can, if you would, uh, you can get your 60 second clock out. We're ready. The clock is ready to go. And again, you can find uh, 
all of these or most of them as they become shorts at uh, you know periodical times here during uh, the next uh, couple of days here on a playbook experts youtube channel so let's go right ahead and get right to it we're going to start off with you mark you're going to lead the show tell us what you like this week you got your uh clock ready and uh you're off and running okay i'm going to stay in the world of college football this weekend where we're down to just 12 teams in college football that have perfect records inside the stats this year only 12 of them and two of them are going head to head against one another one of them is a perfect 7-0 Indiana Hoosiers taking on 5-2 and Washington Huskies. The Indiana Hoosiers are being priced like they are 7-0. Washington's getting no respect whatsoever. They're a team, like I say, has outyarded everybody they've played. I feel the wrong team is favored in this football game. I love how teams perform in the stats, and I think this is a sneaky good underdog on the card this week. Give me the Washington Huskies for an upset special on the card this week. And, Greg, I hope I made it in under 60 seconds. Well, as usual, you made it in with 15 seconds to spare. Good. So uh, you you need a 45-second short. Okay. <laughs> All right, Vic, you're up. Okay, guys. Well, you know, uh, Mark and I think Andy both stole a little bit of my thunder uh, when we talked about some of the college football underdog trends this year. Uh, in the Big Ten, conference dogs, 18 and 17. Big 12, 19 and 14. ACC 15 and 16, Mountain West 11 and 12, AAC 10 and 14. Everything pretty much split right down the middle, except the SEC conference. And Mark, you mentioned it 13 and 2 for SEC conference road dogs this season, including 11 and 0, a perfect 11 and 0 as road dogs of four or more points. Two teams qualify this week Oklahoma plus the points against Old Miss. Missouri plus the points against Alabama. I still can't trust Oklahoma to score points. So for me, it's grabbing the points with Missouri against Alabama. They got a good enough offense to keep this game close. All right, next up, Andy, what do you got for us? Well, you know, I read a lot of the newsletters, including Mark's, but I never look at the newsletters till I'm done with mine so I don't get any influence. We happen to be on one of the similar games this week. And I'm going back to the Big Ten. Wisconsin getting six and a half points at home against uh, Penn State. Took a month for Whiskey to turn things around following a pair of non-covering wins to open the season. A pair of one-sided double-digit losses to Alabama and USC in which the Badgers were outscored 80-31. to 31. Badgers stood 2-2, two 0-4 and two, oh and four ATS. And then, as if a switch were suddenly uh, turned on, uh, Whiskey's run off three straight wins and covers 52-6 to six over Purdue followed by lopsided rights, 40 routes, 42-7 to seven at Rutgers, and then 23-3 last week against Northwestern. Penn State's offense has not been as sharp the last few games. In fact, their last three games, all against Big Ten opponents, had their three lowest offensive yards per play of the season. They are off a bye following that win against USC. I think we get a straight-up win this week by Wisconsin. So all the Cleveland energy here, we have to talk about the Browns. They're going to win this game straight up. Ooh. You got you got Baltimore coming off a big victory, easy peasy, nothing hard about it. You got some offensive linemen coming back for the Browns. You got a running back coming back for the Browns. Quality players. And you finally got Watson out of the lineup. Unfortunately, he got hurt. And Jameis Winston, who is absolutely the biggest motivator on the team, if you ever hear his speeches, it's incredible. He can play if he has a game where he can just figure out which team not to throw the ball to. <laughs> and actually win this game straight up. Okay, we're going to wrap it up with Tony. You ready, Tony? Ready. <laughs> All right, we'll, we'll keep the uh, Jameis Winston love fest going. The Ooh. Winston Whisperer, Mike Bajakian, is now the uh, offensive coordinator for Utah. They dispatched Andy Ludwig, or it was mutual, whatever. It was a disaster what happened last uh, Saturday night against TCU. They were held to seven points. Uh, Horn Frogs, not known for their defense, walked out of Salt Lake City with uh, a road win. So now Bajakian will call plays. Uh, Isaac Wilson, Zach Wilson's little brother, will be the quarterback going forward. We knew that Cam Rising would be done. So they will play at Houston this weekend. Loser falls to 1-4 and four in the Big 12. I think the Utes will ride Micah Bernard in that running game. They've got some, some playmakers 
on the outside too that Wilson should be able to take advantage of. He's already won in Stillwater at Oklahoma State. Uh, so look for Utah to shut down a Houston offense that averages 13.7 points. That's last among power four teams in the country, given the Utes lane four at Houston. And that's why that total is something like around 37, 37 and a half, which is almost unheard of for a game right. involving Iowa. Yep. And yeah, that, <laughs> The, uh, Zeon Chris, the quarterback for Houston, should be back. But I was on, on Houston against Kansas last week. He blew a hamstring early. They went back to Dominic, Dominic Smith. He gave him a little bit of a spark. But, yeah, that's a bad football team. Uh, what, uh, 